Title this, What Are You Looking For? Offensive Christianity, What Are You Looking For? And this message strikes at the heart of your why. Why are you a Christian? Why are you serving the Lord? What do you serve the Lord for? It's the why of a thing. What are your reasons? Because I, I hold that the why controls the what. I hold that why we serve the Lord will, will dictate how we serve the Lord. Father, bless us now as we preach the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Peter, among the things that this letter was written to uphold, it was written to oppose the teachings of a sect called the Epicureans. The Epicureans. The Epicureans. Um, among the things that the Epicureans believed, they believed that the whole world, everything that existed, including the gods, small g-o-d-s, the whole world, including the gods, were made of atoms. And they believed that the atoms that everything was made from had a destination with being dissolved, that they would be destroyed, that everything had a dissolution coming. So no matter what existed, the Epicureans believed that if you could see it, touch it, taste it, and even if you couldn't, that it's made of atoms and it will be dissolved. Are you following me? So therefore they believed that there would be no afterlife. There would be no final judgment. There would be nothing after death. So therefore, if there is nothing, when we die, then there is nothing. The Epicureans taught that the greatest goal of life is that of pleasure. That since we only live once in life, we should go for all of the gusto that life has to offer because once you're dead, the Epicureans said, you're done. And we've heard it before. We've heard it in songs. We've heard these teachings. We've read it in literature. You only have one life to live. And once you live this one life, that's it. It's all over. This hellish doctrine had made its way into the Gentile church to whom second Peter was written. Peter writes in chapter 1, verse 1, to those who have obtained like precious faith. The people he was referencing were Gentiles who had given their hearts to Jesus. They were serving the Lord. They had gone through persecution and prosecution. Nero uh, was on the throne and uh, it was a tough time for the saints. So the Epicureans, follow me on this, I'm headed somewhere. 
their doctrine had made its way into the church. And uh, that goes to show that our day is not the only day or year or time when false teachings worm their way into the Christian church. Peter agreed with the Epicureans, but he only agreed with them in part because they were partially correct. Let me say this to you. For every cult or for every heresy to take hold, they have to give you enough truth to get you to buy the lie. Rat poison is only what? Two to three percent poison. The rest of it is good for the rat. But the danger lies in the poison. I want to say to you, upper room, and our friends who are streaming, and those who are here today, doctrine matter. It matters. Amen. Thank God for praise breaks. Thank God for shouting. Thank God for these things. But saints, it's going to boil down to what you believe and what you know. And if you don't know, Satan is going to fool you. It's going to pull you off track. The Epicureans had made such inroads till it had began to affect the church where Peter had to address them because the truth is their heresies, one of the reasons it was catching on is that it, it appeared, it appealed to the baser nature of people. You can convince folk who don't want to do right anyway that there's no hell. Uh, amen. It's, the next thing you know, they'll join your church. If you can convince them that, you know, like we here today, it don't take all of that. And uh, uh, the, 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 the growth of the doctrines of easy believism. People like that. People don't want to hear preaching, not, well, many, that corrects them, that challenges them. People call you being judgmental and hard when you point out their sin. Jesus said to the Pharisees, I know why you don't like me. He said, because before I came, you didn't have sin. That is, your sins didn't appear. He said, but I've removed the cloak. And now folks see your sin. And now you are offended at me. You should be grateful when the word of God finds you. You should be thankful when the preacher loves you enough to tell you the truth. Because I'm going to tell you something about the Epicureans. They were wrong. They were wrong. And no matter how sincerely no matter how sincere they may have been, no matter how sincere uh, some of the Christians may have been who began to follow them, they were following them off the cliff. So Peter, to, to point out their error, agreed with them where they were right, but he showed them where they were wrong. See, because if they were right, then that would affect the why when it came to the saints serving God. And if they were wrong, it would have an effect on the why. Are you following me? Peter goes along with them partially for in verse 10 he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now watch this. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And notice what he says. And the atoms, the elements, 
You see it? Shall melt with fervent heat. You're right, Epicureans, on this. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Touche, Epicureans. You're right about that. Then he says to the saints, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, that everything you see on earth is going to be dissolved. All these monuments of permanence that we see, all of the skyscrapers, the bridges, the cities, the towns, the homes, the neighborhoods, the factories, the skylines, the stadiums, your home, mine, every article of clothing, every hospital, the sky, the outer space, the Milky Way, seeing that all of these things shall be dissolved, as the Epicureans said, he asks the saint a question. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? He says, since everything is going to leave, going to be dissolved, how should you be walking in holiness? Should you be living right? Peter says, since everything is going down, shouldn't you do right? in your conversation, in your lifestyle, since everything is going down. And, and, then, and then he begins to deal with this word, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. He says, yes, Epicurus, everything will be dissolved, and I'll tell you when. When Jesus comes. There's a day that God has set aside. It's called the day of the Lord. It's not the day of the Epicureans. It's the day of the Lord. There is coming a day. As much as I praise God for this sanctuary, sat down and, and helped design it myself, this sanctuary speaks without saying a word. Every aisle, everything leads right here. This is the, this was the, the, my, behind the design, the thing I had in mind is I, I wanted to put the emphasis on preaching. This is the center of the church. We have singing, we have announcements, we have music, we have you, but the emphasis is preaching. Right here. We designed the building where there's not a bad seat in the house. From, any angle, you can see the preacher. That was by design. But as much as I thank God for this place, this place too will be dissolved. This body and yours, that beautiful dress, that fantastic suit, that bad chariot you drove to church. Everything is going down. Peter said, it will all be destroyed in the day of God. And, and then he emphasizes it again. Wherein, I'm in verse 12, wherein the heavens being on fire, the day will come when the clouds will burn. The sky will burn. The heavens being on fire. Y'all talking about global warming. Somebody better get right with God. Global warming, climate change. But the Bible has already said the day will come when the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and you are right, Epicureans, and the elements, the, the atoms shall melt with fervent heat. But, but, but now, Epicureans, let me show you where we part company. Because you believe that when everything gets dissolved, there's no afterlife. There's no hereafter. But Peter said in verse 13, nevertheless, we, good God Almighty, we, the born again, 
the born again according to his promise. See, uh, Epicureans, Jesus made us a promise. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Paul said, now concerning them that are asleep. He said, I want to write to you that we sorrow not as them who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, then we believe that when Jesus Christ comes back, he will bring them with him. And he said that when the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the middle of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Epicureans, I know that you are saying that there's no afterlife, but he made us a promise. And, and, and we believe his promise. We believe his promise. So according to his promise, guess what? Guess what? Here's our why. Here's what motivates us. We look for new heaven. See that in verse, four, in verse 13? We look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. We our why, the reason we serve the Lord is that we know that this is not all that there is. See, see you, you can't let the devil make you think that this is it. See, the, you, you won't like me, but that explains how so many uh, are so scared of COVID. Well, I don't, well, don't want to get that because it might kill me. Well, you're going to die anyway. All of us are. We used to believe that God controlled those things, but you know, so much for that. But you know, saints looked forward to in times past going home. We sang songs about going home. Oh, I want to see him to look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. Walk the streets of glory. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all pass, home at last, forever to rejoice. That changed, that changed, that changed, that changed. A virus that killed actually less worldwide, maybe 1% of the people who contracted it worldwide. The overwhelming majority who died from it had at least four comorbidities. That is, at least four things were wrong with them already. The overwhelming majority of people who came in contact with it and got it, their treatment was Tylenol and orange juice. And rest. You quarantine for a few days, next thing I know, you're back on your feet. And yet, yet that thing shut down churches and put fear in the hearts of believers which showed that our why has changed. Are you praying for me? I want, I want you to let that sink in. Some of you are struggling with what I'm telling you. But I'm telling you the truth. See, 
see, the why of a thing controls a lot of things. See, because if your intention is to go to heaven, see, if you really want to go to heaven and you really believe there's a heaven, first thing you know is that heaven's a holy place and ain't nobody going to heaven but the pure in heart. Praise the Lord. None but the righteous shall see God. So if heaven, going to heaven is your why, that why will sanctify you. That why will make you love your enemy because you know you're not going to heaven if you don't. That why will make you walk out of relationships that you ought not to be in because you know you're not going to heaven with them. But a strange thing took place about 20 years ago, 20 or 25 years ago in the church world. I hate to say it, but I'm going to say, no, I don't hate to say it. The so-called word movement, charismatic movement, and the proliferation of independent churches shifted the why of believers from heaven to material things. From I want to see Jesus when I die. Shifted it from waiting to get your slice of the pie that's in the sky to getting your slice now. So we move from serving God because we want to go to heaven one day because we want to see Jesus in peace to serving God because we want a bigger house. Nice duds. Bling, bling. A big car. Money to uh, self-realization. I remember even though the Bible says uh, that, uh, praise the Lord, no man ever hated himself. And the Bible says that Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me and deny himself. Yeah, right. I remember some of the biggest names in the, in the Christian world preaching to people saying, you got to learn to love yourself. Because you, if you can't love yourself, you can't love anyone else. Even though the Bible doesn't teach Self-love. The Bible teaches that a man needs to, Jesus said, you can't be my disciple unless you deny yourself. Not fall in love with yourself. You know why the Bible doesn't put, place emphasis on falling in love with ourselves? Because that's where we start. You gotta convince a man to love himself. Mm, that we love us. If self tells us to get drunk, we drink. Self tell us to steal, we steal. Self say lie, we lie. Self say put drugs in our bodies, we do that. Self say cheat on your wife, we do that. Self says steal from people, we do that. Whatever self says, we do. Christianity says deny yourself. That voice in your head that speaks to you, that says disobey God, Christianity says deny yourself. And Jesus said, unless you deny yourself, you cannot be my disciple. Man came and changed it. And we soon realized that you could still get a new house from the Lord and hate your neighbor. We soon realized that God would still give you a new car while you're cheating with that woman. We found out that God could bless you with a new pair of shoes even though you don't even speak to your brother or sister in Christ. See, when your why changed, when the why went from going to see Jesus to getting material things, it automatically allows for a lot of stuff that going to heaven won't allow for. 
when your why is to go to heaven, you can't hate people because their color is different from yours. When your why is to go to heaven, you can't, praise the Lord, follow BLM or critical race theory when your why is to go to heaven because the Bible teaches that you don't uh, uh, render evil for evil nor railing for railing. The Bible teaches that we're not to be overcome with evil, but to overcome evil with good. But when your why, are y'all praying for me? When your why is no longer to see Jesus, but to just get things. You find out, you find out that you can get things and allow for a whole lot of stuff. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. A lot of stuff. Because uh, we see examples in the world where the worst living people are rich. Billionaires have filthy mouths. Athletes speak blasphemies. Movie stars live de lives of debauchery. Preach wouldn't. While they sail on their 60, 70, and 120 foot yachts, drive a uh, car that some cost a million dollars, some run 500,000. Praise the Lord, the thing almost a city block long, and he drives past you with all kind of women on his arm, and the name of two or three others written on his chest. Living in sin, and, but can get things. Then you learn about Christians who claim to be saved, but they ain't live, they're not living right, but they still have an accumulation of things. So if your why is things or things, you want things, you're serving the Lord because you want 13 steps to how you can be your best self and get more things. That why allows for envy. Jealousy, homosexuality, lesbianism, fornication, oh, and the list. But if your why is to go to the new heaven and that new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, all of a sudden, you start taking stuff off. All of a sudden, you start changing your life because you want to go where Jesus is and none but the righteous shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Look at your neighbor and say, it's the why of a thing. I ask them, why are you here? Why are you serving God? Why are you serving God? Praise the Lord. Are you just looking for, I hope y'all listening to me, there's too much commotion going on. Are you looking for a husband? Is that why? You here just looking for a wife? Is that, is that your why? Is your why that you just want to feel better? Or you want this or you want that? Why? What are you here for? What are you here for? What are you in the church for? Many of us, we have the wrong why. The Epicureans gave them the wrong why. Had them thinking that, praise the Lord, there's no afterlife, no way. There's no heaven. There's no hell. Praise the Lord. Well, you know what? Well, what's left? Pleasure. Pleasure. Self. Self-gratification. You live for you. You become the center of your universe. But after all, when it's over, there's nothing. Peter said, no, you're right, about, you're right about the atoms. You're right that everything is going to be dissolved. But what you're wrong is, that's when everything begins. See, that's where you're missing out. That's when it all starts. See, because when everything here is dissolved in time, eternity begins. When you die, that's not the end. 
that's just the beginning. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Don't you think that the last person whose body lay across, praise the Lord, this altar, that they ceased to exist, they had to stand before a holy God and give an account of the deeds done in their bodies. And uh, the Bible said uh, that it is once appointed unto you, me and all of us, to die. And after death, see, that's what the Epicurus did. That's where they fail. They said there's no after death. No, 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 no. The Bible said, and after death, after death, after death. I'm just thinking about my loved one laying up there in that cold grave. Ain't no loved one laying in no cold grave. Their shell may be. That body may be, but they're not there. Go, on, go, go see if you can find them. They, if they could speak to you spiritually, they'd call you a fool. Say, you know what you've been taught. The, 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 they went looking for Jesus on the third day in the graveyard. They went looking for him. And the angel didn't even understand why they were there. The angel said, I don't know why you're here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't you remember what he said? He said, three days later, I will return. The angel said, he's not here. He's not here. He's not here. I'm here to tell you, you will never, your body will, but you'll never go to a funeral home. You'll never attend your own way. Right. Never. never. Nor you, nor me. Our bodies will, but we won't. Right. The moment you die, eternity begins. The moment you leave here, you better get your why right. And ain't nobody ever, nobody's ever gone. No one's body goes to the grave with a U-Haul truck behind it. With all of their goodies and their watches and all that jewelry. And if they do bury it, I guarantee you, if when you, you, when you go back by that uh, graveyard later on that night, thieves gonna be digging all that stuff up, going straight to the pawn shop, putting it on, saying, well, he don't need it. <laughs> the bishop's ring is consecrated. The bishop's cross and chain is consecrated. But before they close that burr, they take all that off. So yes, but I know you enjoyed it, wouldn't Let me get this. Don't give it to the wife or somebody. You can't, that ain't going. Do y'all hear me preaching here? Peter said, Peter said, no, we have a different why because we are looking for a new heaven. We're looking for a new earth. Good God Almighty, uh, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now check this out, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things. Seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. I got a question to ask you. Word diligent, you know what diligent means. Diligent means to make every effort. Since it's tough when you, you have a preach teach Sunday. I really want to preach it hard, but I need to teach it. So the preacher and the teacher mother is contending. So I go up and I come back down because they're contending. Now let me tell you something. The word diligent means to make every effort. Now I got a question for you. You who are here in the sanctuary. I asked them in the eight o'clock. People everywhere, God is so good to us. Our church is so blessed. People flying in from everywhere joining. People finding the word of God, riding great distances. God blesses Peter. We don't owe anything. God is good. We're blessed. We're blessed. But I got a question to ask you. You who are streaming, I got a question to ask you. Now, I don't want anybody to answer the question. I can't answer this question, but I got a question to ask you. Would you? Somebody, please get your phone. I don't know why the phone be on in the church. 
Would you, would you use the word diligent to describe your service for God? Would you use the word diligent to describe your church attendance? Would you use the word diligence to describe your participation in the church? After being here, what's diligent about you? Would you use diligence when applied to how often you come? Would you use the word diligent to describe your Bible study time? What about your prayer life? So I didn't ask you would anybody use the word diligent. I'm asking you to be honest. Would, would, you, would you really call yourself, say that, that you're diligent to pray? That is, you make every effort. You're diligent to study the word of God. You, you're diligent... Uh, let's see, what about tithing? What about giving? Are you diligent to give? What about how often you come to church? Are you diligent? Or uh, uh, is it that uh, you come when you can? You come when it's comfortable. You do when you want to. You operate when it's convenient. Would you use the word diligent? See, the why determines the what. If you're looking for a new heaven and a new earth and you're seeking for such things, you see, then that affects your attitude toward service. Are you diligent to get that grudge out of you that you've been holding against somebody? What about that affair? What about that pet sin? I'm preaching good. I'm preaching better than you are saying amen. What about those things that we know that God is not pleased with? Are you diligent? Are you making every effort to be the Christian that you should be? If the answer is no, then uh, the reason uh, may be found in your why. It may be that you don't mean heaven all the way. It could be that you don't even think heaven all the way. It could be that heaven all the way, seeing Jesus one day, seeing his face in peace, seldom comes to your mind. But what comes to your mind is making it here. Getting along with everybody. Getting your children through college. Making sure you're popular. Yeah, yeah. A better neighborhood, a better zip code, a better address. Getting through school. Carnal things, carnality, carnality, carnality. I know this, COVID show proved uh, as, as churches folded like cheap tents before, before the governor could, in some states where the governor left, the, left it up to the church, the church still closed. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, is that diligent? We, we, we heard preachers uh, come up with new standards. The new standards is safety. Well, what you gonna tell all the martyrs down through the years who died for the faith? What are you gonna say to all of the missionaries down through the years, Christian missionaries who went into areas where there were malaria and all kinds of diseases and all kinds of sicknesses and many of those missionaries died trying to save other people, but they did it in the name of the Lord. But they were motivated. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to silence the whole house. I, uh, uh, you, you two, we got a good crowd. I, I, y'all done got. 
Is this upper room? What, what? These people, these people laid it all on the line to save others. What about people like those brave firemen, 9-11, who were clear, who were out of the towers, who were safe, but for a greater call, went back in and never came out. Many of those men were Christians and many of them were not. And yet they had more dedication to the cause than we had to coming to the house of God. Wouldn't it be something if God gave me these ABC sermons? But he always gave me the messages that just bang. You don't even see it coming. The next thing you know, bam. So I didn't see that. Well, you see it now. Would you use the word diligent to describe your relationship with your Bible? Would you? Would you? What about, watch this one. What about the missionaries? I'm gonna collect some of these licenses. Cause you don't need license to stay home. Ordained and scared. No, at, at, at a certain level, you become a leader. That's at a certain level. And uh, my, you know, my heroes are these church mothers, these senior citizens out here, brave as can be, standing their ground. And, and on the other hand, you got some healthy person in their 30s, scared. And when they do come out, they have three masks on. Something's wrong with that. Would you describe, would you use the word diligence to describe, praise the Lord, your attitude toward God, to be found in him in peace? Are you working hard to be at peace with you and your Savior? And not just the Savior, but I heard him say, follow peace with all men. How diligent are you in uh, establishing peace? Bible says, follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So how diligent are you working toward not just peace, but being without spot, without spot. God, I'm working. Lord, I found spots in my personality. I found spots in my behavior. How hard are you working to get rid of those spots? Or do we just say, well, the Lord knows my heart. The Lord understands. The Lord knows know I'm just like I am but are you diligent am I diligent would would we be able to use the word diligent to describe our the efforts that we're putting forth to overcome our weaknesses when last time you prayed hard about that struggle when last time well I got a struggle or when last time you turned your plate down the last time I said when was it well, the last time, when? All right, okay. 1990. <laughs> that explains, that explains why. That explains why we can't grow, can't get any better. Why I walk with the Lord is such a struggle. What's missing is diligence. What's missing is effort. Takes effort to live holy. The, the Pilgrim Jubilee says it got to put forth an effort to be a good Christian. It takes effort. It takes effort to forgive. I know you can't, you still holding a grudge against your mama. She didn't do right when you were a baby. And I know you're telling the truth when you describe what she did. 
But at 75, don't you think? You ought to put forth a little effort to put that behind you. How long, how long will you carry things in your spirit? What effort, what diligence are you putting forth to overcome it? All right, he left you. He left. He left. He left. He told you he was going to get a cup of coffee. He didn't even say loaf of bread. He left. But he's been gone 20 years. You mean to tell me 20 years later you're still sitting there festering. Now you can't stand anybody. Mad at all men. 20 years later. That's because you didn't put forth an effort to get that out of your spirit. Oh, y'all, you're not praying for me. You're not praying for me today. Oh, I guess I just got to, I got to preach on my own today. I got to, y'all gonna make me preach to these lights. The Bible is right. The Bible says in 1 Peter, and I'm gonna take off, I'm gonna land this plane. I may not get finished today. 1 Peter chapter number two and verse uh Number one says, wherefore, laying aside all malice. Word laying aside comes from a Greek word that means get rid of. It means to cast off. Cast is an interesting word. Anything you got to cast off, it means that thing is not a gentleman. It's not a lady. It won't leave when you politely ask it to leave you alone. No, it grabs hold to you. It latches on to you. And you got to fight to get rid of it. Fight to get rid of that craving. Fight to get rid of that desire. Fight to get rid of that pain. And when you throw it off, it'll grab you again. You gotta throw it off again, grab you again. It's a battle, it's back and forth, back and forth. But you keep fighting until you overcome it because you can't let that thing destroy you. You cannot allow it to overcome you because what's at stake is that new heaven and that new earth that's gonna proceed from the throne of God. And oh, I got to be there. How many got to be there? Songwriter said, don't call, call the roll till I get there. They gonna call the roll. They gonna call the roll when they call the roll. You better be there to answer. Mm, so you know what? We got the fight to lay aside certain things. Lay aside what? Malice, evil intent. The intention to do harm. Malice and all guile. Guile is deceit. Guile is deceit and hypocrisy. Uh, hypocrisies, pretending to be who and what you're not. And then envyings. Envy is, is uh, resentment that we hold against somebody because of a perceived on our part advantage that they have. They may not even have an advantage over you. You just perceive that they do. You think they do, they may not. Envy is in your head and in your heart. You may envy them because of their house and envy them because of their car and envy them because of their lifestyle. Let me, I got news for you. You could get a bigger house and a bigger car and have a better lifestyle. And guess what? You'll still envy them because envy don't have anything to do with the things. Envy is in the head and in the heart. And so you have to fight to get rid of that. There's a lot of envy uh, in the church and in the hearts of people. We resent people because of their progress. We resent people because of their success like their success came at your expense. My being where I am have no bearing on you whatsoever. And if I wasn't here, you'd still be there. That's, that's the way envy works. And you have to fight to get rid of that. Don't let that just uh, fester and just set up in your heart. And he says, oh, envying. And then you know what goes hand in hand with envy? Evil speaking. 
evil speaking. That is slander. When you envy a person, you will slander them. Oh, you talk about them like a dog. So these are things that you have to fight to lay aside. Nothing helps you fight to get that stuff out of your spirit, to forgive people. Nothing helps you fight to get rid of all those things like wanting to see Jesus in peace. You realize that it's not worth it. The grudge is not worth it. Nothing is worth missing that new heaven and that new earth those things that Christ has for us. My God, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. If I have to let you get away with doing me wrong, I'm still going. If I have to let you lie on me and I don't lie back on you, I'm still going. If it means that I look like a fool, I'm still going. Mm, I wonder tonight, today, is there anybody here who said, because of my why, because of the why that I have, I've got to lay things aside. I've got to get better because I want to be blameless before him. And I know that you all have been making fun of him because you've been saying, where is the promise of his coming? In verse 4, you said, where is the promise of his coming? But I heard him say in verse 15, account, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Other words, just know that the reason Jesus has not come back yet, he's waiting on one more soul to get saved. You know Jesus could have came back in 1976, but I'm glad he didn't because he saved my soul in 1977. And I know the Lord could have come back, oh Lord, in July of this year, but somebody just got saved the other day in August of this year. And I know they're glad that Jesus hadn't come back yet. He's waiting, oh Lord, for people to get right with God. He's waiting and putting up with things. He put up with Obama decking the White House out in homosexual colors. He could have came back then, but he didn't do it because he's waiting for someone else to get saved. He could have come back after America aborted over 60 million unborn babies, but he's still waiting, hoping that someone else would get saved. He could have come back when we sanctioned same-sex marriage, when we've turned our back on the Lord, but he's still waiting for someone else to get saved. But I'm here to tell you today that he won't wait forever. I'm here to tell you today that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And I'm striving to be ready. I'm working to be ready. How many want to be ready when Jesus comes? Let me hear you say yeah. Yeah! Oh, Lord, touch me, Jesus. Touch me, Lord. Anoint me to lay aside every weight and every sin that doth so easily beset me, that doth so easily tangle me up and let me run with patience the race that is set before me looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of my faith. How many love the Lord with all your heart? How many have a mind to be aggressive toward the Lord? You've been laying around, you've been laying around You've been taking it easy, but it, do, do you feel that it's time to shift gears 
and to seek the Lord like you've never sought him before to read your word like you've never read it before to go down on your knees like you never prayed before yeah oh Lord somebody give him praise praise him because he's real praise him because he's good I love the Lord he heard my cry yeah yeah oh. uh -huh. you know uh, I'm, I'm done but you know there's a reason I talk about my pastor as much as I do. There's a reason that I go back and talk about the old songs as much as I do. Uh, because Peter told me to remember. He said, I want to stir up your mind through remembering. I don't have anything new to tell you. You just need to let your mind go back to what I told you before. I told you that God is a healer. I told you that Jesus is a company keeper in a lonely hour. I told you that the Lord will make a way somehow. You need to do while you're going through is just let your mind run back to what I told you, to what I've taught you, to what the prophet said, to what the Bible said, to what Jesus said, and grab hold to it. Hallelujah. Don't you live your life scared to death. Don't you live your life afraid you're going to die at any time don't you live your life afraid of COVID and afraid of the devil live your life knowing that soon and very soon we're going to see the king no more crying over there no more lying over there no more dying over there soon very soon we're gonna be caught up in the rapture yeah. Ah, yeah somebody praise the Lord somebody praise the Lord Woo! ain't God all right ain't God all right ain't God all right let me hear you say yeah Somebody give him glory. Give God an aggressive praise. Give God an offensive praise. Praise him like you believe it. Praise him like you know.
So, so, three things. Three things. Number one, remember, remember what you've been taught. I, I told them, uh, Judge Gillum, I told them, I told them Thursday night that when Peter says, stir up your mind, stir up comes from a, a Greek word that literally means woke. So that's the real woke. Not this, not this garbage they got out now. But the, uh, God says, I want to wake you up to godly realities. then and then number two is beware yeah. lest you fall into the era of the wicked I want to explain something I want to explain something because I love to leave everybody dancing but everybody joy getting ready to go away just like wooden. The era of the wicked that he was referring to was something that's called the golden mean. M-E-A-N. G-O-L-D-E-N. M-E-A-N. The golden mean. What is that? What is that? The era of the wicked. The golden mean. Because remember now, the error of the wicked would cause you to fall yeah. from your steadfastness. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're up here, right? Mm -hmm. You're right here? Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, he says there's a, there's, a, there's a teaching that'll make you fall from it. Mm -hmm. Here's what it was. The teaching was not that people should give themselves to unbridled hedonism. Unbridled hedonism is almost like a person who loves cake. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the greatest cake eater in here knows that you might enjoy a slice or two per setting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you eat 10 slices, right. it's going to make you sick. Right. So no matter how much you love it, you know that you can't consume it without limits. It's almost like your favorite fragrance, perfume or ladies perfume or cologne men. Applied properly, it smells great. But if you put on the whole bottle, that's too much. Can't nobody take you. Am I right about it? So the goal mean was this. You sin, mm -hmm. you do your thing, you don't not sin. It's why it's error. Mm -hmm. But you sin, you drink. Mm -hmm. I explain it to you this way. Go and drink, but you just don't get sloppy drunk. But you're still drinking. Right. See? So you didn't believe in drinking until someone introduced the golden mean. And they said, you know, McNeil, you don't have to get drunk, but ain't nothing wrong with a little tonic. So now you're able to drink and control it. But there was a time in your steadfastness you weren't drinking at all. See, the, the golden mean. Doesn't say, uh, littles, you, you listen, you can't have 20 girlfriends and a wife, but you can have one. Keep that quiet. Nobody knows. And you'll be fine. Okay? You ain't gonna tell it. She ain't gonna tell it. You're a smart guy. Told you I wouldn't kill you, Jordan. Uh, nobody will know. 
then you say, well, that's a good idea. Okay. You don't have to uh, tithe all the time. Just do the best you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Golden me. In other words, you you still keep your mess, but just do it where you can control it. Wow. We, we've heard of the golden mean before. It's called, it don't take all that. It's, 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 it's called freedom. Some of you little churches that ain't got no rules. Anything goes now, see. Golden mean, see, you, see, see ain't nothing new underneath the sun. Oh, all you got to do is study. Everything is in that Bible. You just have to apply yourself. Or come and sit under a ministry at what the preacher does and learn something. Yeah, see, golden me. I ain't got to show you, Sister Monet, how much I hate you. I can just keep it in me. Nobody will know. I haven't, I haven't forgiven you. Oh, no. That's my friend. That's why I'm picking. I, I, I still, the I, I still can't stand y'all. But I won't show it. Now, nobody can see my heart. Now, you know, if I was a regular preacher, I would have closed out with everybody shouting. But I promised you that I would teach you the era of the wicked. See, it's, it's, it is the doctrine of uh, being a functional addict. A functional drunk. Nobody really knows you drink. Nobody will really even know that that muscle man standing over there is a homosexual. But he learned how to hide it. Instead of getting delivered, he says, what I won't do is I just won't embarrass the kingdom. I'll keep my stuff on the low. And nobody will ever know. But he never comes out. So he thinks that he's getting along fine because people don't know about his era. See, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do anything about this lust that I have in my heart. I'm just not going to say anything to the girl who is the affection of the lust. That's the golden mean. Jesus says you got to do something about it. Whether you say anything to her or not. See, that's what it means by falling from your own steadfastness. See, you, you were up here, but you let somebody, some of these little, he mentioned them, unstable souls who takes the scriptures and twists them out of context. They got beside you. And when, when they finished talking to you, you didn't love holiness anymore. You didn't want to do right anymore. Oh, they, they made you feel bad because the preacher read the Bible. But the Bible teaches you shall make no markings on your body. None, that was the Bible says, of the living nor the dead. That was the Bible says. Patrick Wooden didn't write the Bible. I'm called the preacher. Now, if you put marks on you before you knew, the Bible doesn't call for you to get them removed. The, the principle in the Bible is clear. Now, if you want to get them removed, it's up to you. But the Bible says this about sins that we sin before we met the Lord. Let him that stole steal no more. The Bible doesn't say return that flat screen. <laughs> See, because if they catch you breaking in, <laughs> trying to put it back, you're going to jail. Just thank God, hallelujah. Thank God that, that he gave you grace and you got away with it. Everybody's gotten away with something. Say amen. 
Uh, yours might not have been a flat screen. Maybe they didn't have flat screens out when you were a thief. <laughs> Everybody's done something. Ain't nobody sin. Ain't nobody sinless. We're all forgiven. But the Bible says you don't go back and try to fix that. You just don't do that anymore. But now, but now, see, when you get in the golden mean, you know what you'll do? You'll start, next thing you know, since you've been saved, since you joined the church, since you come into the knowledge of the truth, there's a new one. And another. See, and somebody done got with you and said, oh, that's just the Old Testament. Thou shalt not kill this Old Testament too. Thou shalt not steal this Old Testament. You want to go there? You're talking to a scholar. You want to have that discussion? I'll rip you to shreds. I'll make you wish you'd never gone there. Any of you. Because I know what the Bible says. See, that, that golden mean was error. And it slipped in and it taught people how to sin respectfully. That'll preach right there. Respectable sin. So that's why he talks about removing all hypocrisies. Respectfully. You know, it's together. It's together. Don't nobody know? It's together. You look holier than uh, Mary Magdalene. It's together. You look like Bishop Mason standing there. It's together. Holy. But you know there may be all kinds of God and evil going on. But you don't get rid of it because you lowered your standard. Peter said instead of falling for that, he says, but grow. Go from this place of this place here. Instead of falling, he says, grow. Grow in grace. Grow in this. How do you grow? He says, grow in grace. God's going to grace you to do it. And not the error of the wicked. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You grow in this. That's why you got to come to church. Why you got to, how can they hear without a preacher? You got to come and get preached to. You got to come and get taught. And you got to read it for yourself. So you can grow. And as you grow, when we grow in him, here's, here's the thing that takes place. Here's the dynamic. As we grow in him, we move away from error. As we grow in him, we move away from falling. As we grow in him, we grow away from fear. See, as you grow in God, you're putting distance between you and the enemy. And you look back, you done left the devil out of sight because you're yeah. growing and growing and growing. That is offensive Christianity. You got the ball and you're extending it. You're moving it. You're moving it. You're advancing, that's the word, advancing the ball. Who today wants to advance the ball? Who wants to move forward in Christ Jesus? If there's anyone in here today who feels that need, stand on your feet right where you are. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. In the highest heaven. He's a mighty God. A true God. And an everlasting King. If the word of the Lord have shown you where you need to ask God to forgive you. Then repent. Say, Lord, I'm, I thank you for being in the church where I can see myself. Thank you for being where the word will find me. Good God Almighty. Now, Lord, I want to grow. Now, Lord, I want to grow. I want to get better. I want to get better. 
I want to move up. I want to move up. I want to move up. I want to get better. I want to get closer. I want to draw nearer. Hallelujah. I've been where I am. John, I've been here long enough. I need to grow in grace. Uh, Father, we stand before you right now. And Lord, we, we embrace this idea, this, this, this idea of, of, of offensive Christianity. Instead of us standing around, being afraid, waiting and hoping that Satan won't see us and that we won't draw his fire, we're hiding in the shadows. Instead, Lord, we come before you today. Our friends online, pray with us now. We come before you today, Lord, asking you for strength and the anointing to advance the ball. Oh, God, in this day and time, with everything that is before us, we stand in week 66 saying, God, anoint us to advance the ball in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, touch us collectively and touch us individually that we will all grow. Your word declares that it is your will that we all grow. That we grow up to be one building in Christ Jesus. That we grow in grace. Lord, we don't want one of two of us to grow. But God, grow us all in the name of Jesus. Grow us all. In the name of Jesus, you are a mighty God. You are the true God and an everlasting King. In the name of Jesus, grow us, Lord. We come against the doctrine of the Epicureans. We know that you have something waiting on the other side. We, oh God, we shift our why. And we go back to that original why. We want to see you in peace. We want to go to heaven. We don't want to die and participate in the second death. We want to go to heaven. We want to see you in peace. In the name of Jesus. We want to live forever with you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. We want to go where you are. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you. Oh, Father, we praise you. God, fill every person today. Fill every soul with the Holy Spirit. God, touch that troubled mind and bring peace. In the name of Jesus. God, anoint us, Lord, to grow as a collective. As a collective as a whole, as a church. Father, it is my prayer as the pastor of this ministry that no one is left out. That everyone grow, 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 grow in the things of the Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And amen. amen. Would you praise the God of the Bible? <laughs> Hallelujah. He is so good. And he is worthy to be praised. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. And he has touched us today. Hallelujah.